Hello and welcome to the 14th episode of the Inova Biosciences webinar series. Today's webinar, an introduction to immunohistochemistry, basic principles, and how to simplify your staining procedures, will discuss assay principles, a general IHC protocol, and hints and tips for simplifying your staining procedures. Our speaker today is Dr. Andy Lane. Andy has extensive laboratory experience in various immunodetection techniques. Today, he will walk you through various aspects of IHC and cover the points outlined on the slide. So topics covered will range from the basics of immunohistochemistry to tissue preparation to staining protocols, and we will discuss the differences between direct and indirect staining in IHC. So there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Please submit your questions by typing in the questions box in your control panel, which is circled in red here. And feel free to send questions throughout the webinar, and we will answer as many as we can in the Q&A session. And any remaining questions will be answered by email in the next few days. So that's the basics laid out. Now please welcome Andy. Okay, thank you, Claudina, for the introduction. And uh, welcome to everyone um, who's listening today. I'd like to start with a very simple slide really just talking about a definition of immunohistochemistry. If you look around on the internet, you'll find a number of different definitions. Um, one of the ones that I liked most is the one that I've uh, chosen to show here. And it reads, the microscopic study of tissues with the aid of antibodies that bind to tissue components and reveal their presence. I think that summarizes immunohistochemistry quite well. Immunohistochemistry is often abbreviated just to IHC, and that's probably um, what I'll do quite often through this uh, webinar today. And it's often also known as immunohistology. As a technique, it provides data about the expression of antigens, um, and it does that within the context of the structure of tissues or organs. That actually offers some important advantages over techniques such as Western blotting and flow cytometry. If you think about Western blotting, you've taken your cell population or maybe uh, an organ sample, um, and you've processed that effectively. You've lysed all of the cells and the tissues, and you can look for um, antigen expression, protein expression within that mixture. Obviously, if your particular protein is only present within a subset of the cells of the tissue that you've just processed, you're not going to know which cells it's present in. With flow cytometry, um, it's not quite the same as Western blotting. Um, you are actually looking at whole cells, but you're looking at a cell suspension. Um, so you're not looking um, at expression within the structure of the organ. I just put an example of some staining um, in the slide at the bottom here. This actually shows CD34 staining in human colon. Now, CD34 is an antigen that's often known as a stem cell marker, especially in those of you that of you work with the hematopoietic system. Um, but it also is an important marker of endothelial cells. And when you stain human colon here, you'll see that the stained structures are actually blood vessels and the endothelium of those blood vessels. Um, and the other structures within the colon are not stained. So that's a really good example of antigen expression in the context uh, of the tissue that you're looking at. So moving on, I'm going to spend just a couple of slides talking about um, the very basics of tissue preparation. Firstly, I'm going to think briefly about paraffin-embedded tissue. And many of you will be very familiar with the fact that uh, embedding tissues in paraffin is the best option to maintain the cellular, cellular structure. Um, but this sort of fixation and processing does have a number of issues, especially in the context of IHC itself. If you are taking this approach, you need to fix the tissue in formalin immediately after it's been harvested. And generally, you undertake that for between 4 to 24 hours. You really want to avoid overfixation, especially if you're doing IHC. Overfixation um, can damage antigens, and we'll probably refer to that again later. 
Following fixation, the tissues are dehydrated, i.e. they're taken from an aqueous into an alcoholic environment, and then embedded in hot paraffin, although you can also sometimes um, use plastic for embedding. Tissue blocks that are prepared in this way can be stored for many, many years, and they are the source of many of the tissue archives that are available in various places worldwide. Another advantage of these blocks is, as well as using them for immunohistology and, and standard histology, you can extract DNA, etc., and undertake molecular studies with these tissues. When you come to use the tissue blocks, obviously you have to prepare um, tissue sections for staining, and you prepare 5 to 10 micrometer thick sections by the microtome. And just prior to labeling, you rehydrate the tissue section. So you take them through um, a series of steps, um, dissolving the paraffin wax um, in, in xylene and bringing them back to an aqueous environment. As I mentioned before, you need to be aware for IHC purposes that the fixation process can damage the antigens that are present. And that does mean that some antibodies will not recognize their antigens after the tissue has been fixed. Um, in formalin and processed in this way. So moving on to the next slide and to the next um, form of tissue preparation, um, I'm going to talk about frozen tissue preparation, um, which is uh, also often used. In this method, small pieces of tissue can be snap frozen, um, either directly in liquid nitrogen um, or in isopentane in combination with, with dry ice. Um, the small pieces of tissue are snap frozen very quickly and then are generally wrapped up in, in a piece of silver foil and can be stored, again, either in liquid nitrogen itself or in minus 80 freezers. When you come to use those tissues, um, you can um, cut them, cut sections using a cryostat which is basically a microtome um, that keeps the tissue sections and the tissue frozen during the process. You carry out the fixation of, of these tissues actually immediately before staining, um, often using acetone as the most common fixative for frozen tissues. It's fair to say that tissue morphology with frozen sections is not nearly so good as with paraffin embedded material but the level of antigen damage caused by frozen tissue is much reduced and most antibodies will react with their antigen as you would expect them to. There are a number of other subtle, uh, subtly different approaches um, to tissue preparation, um, but the formalin fix, paraffin embedding and the frozen tissue are the two main ones and the ones that I'll just talk about today. So moving on from the preparation, um, I've put a couple of slides in that I've considered to be um, tissue pretreatment and to think about a couple of aspects in relation to this. Again, thinking first about paraffin embedded tissue, um, I'd like to talk briefly about antigen retrieval techniques. So as I've said before, formalin fixation can damage antigens, basically due to cross-linking of, of the proteins within the tissue. That can mean that antibodies no longer recognize the antigen. There are two general types of antigen retrieval um, that are used to overcome this. Um, one is the uh, approach of proteolytic digestion, and the second is the so-called heat-induced epitope retrieval. It's probably fair to say that proteolytic digestion is the older of these techniques and has been around for many, many years. And using these processes, tissue sections are incubated in either trypsin or pronase as proteolytic enzymes and they actually begin to break down and reduce the cross-linking that is present. Some antigens um, respond better to one enzyme than the other or some antigens in, in combination with a particular antibody. So you may find that an antibody um, may respond or may react better after a tissue has been treated with trypsin but not with pronase or vice versa. A more recent technique, albeit that this has been around again possibly for now a couple of decades, 
is the heat-induced epitope retrieval. This is where you effectively um, heat in a solution the uh, tissue slides, again, to have the same effect of reducing the cross-linking caused by the fixation. You can undertake this either in a pressure cooker or in many cases nowadays using a microwave. We tend to use three cycles of heating and people either use an acidic buffer at around about pH 6 or an alkaline buffer at pH 9. Once again, some antigens respond better to one pH than to the other and some antibodies um, will work on a particular antigen um, after treatment at pH 6, but not at pH 9, and vice versa. Antigen retrieval is only really required in formal and fixed um, paraffin-embedded material. Tissue pretreatment for the frozen tissues focuses on a slightly different area, and that's really on endogenous enzyme inhibition. Um, there are two enzymes that are used in immunostaining, and both of these may occur naturally within tissues. The first and perhaps the most common is peroxidase, um, and that's with staining with the horseradish peroxidase or HRP systems. A number of tissues contain endogenous peroxidase, and they can lead to quite high levels of background in those systems. You can block this by pre-treating your frozen sections with 0.3% hydrogen peroxide, um, usually in PBS, sometimes in methanol. Um, the other enzyme commonly used in IHC is alkaline phosphatase. And similarly, some tissues contain endogenous alkaline phosphatase. Um, the activity of this can be blocked using a pre-treatment with 5 millimolar levamisole. It's fair to say that endogenous enzymes are really only a major problem within frozen tissues. The formalin fixing and the paraffin embedded processes tend to um, reduce any levels of endogenous enzyme activity. Um, so blocking of those enzymes in those tissues is generally not so important. I'm going to move on now, having pre-treated your tissues, um, to just consider the very, very basic principles of immunostaining. And on the screen now is a very, very simple diagram that I'll just run through. At the top of the diagram is a representation of a tissue slide or tissue section. Um, and on that um, are four triangles. Um, these are the antigen um, that you're looking to stain. And I haven't complicated this by showing all the other thousands of antigens that are present. Um, in the simple step, um, you add an antibody that is specific for that antigen. And you can see that on the right-hand side. Um, this is your primary antibody that binds to the antigen and you hope not to any other tissue components or any other antigens that are present. And then moving to the final step at the bottom, you add a secondary antibody. This is the standard approach with immunostaining. And you'll notice that the secondary antibody does two things. Firstly, it recognizes the primary antibody. You see the green binding to the black. But you will also see attached to the secondary antibody um, representation of, of an enzyme molecule, this um, blue diamond. This is either a horseradish peroxidase or an alkaline phosphatase molecule. And this is used um, to visualize, in combination with a substrate, the presence of the, the primary antibody. I'm going to go through some of those steps in more detail and think about some alternatives to this simple technique. But this is a very simplistic way of looking at immunostaining. Basically, you're using antibodies to detect the antigen, and then you're coming in with some sort of visualization system, in this case, a secondary antibody conjugated to an enzyme. This next slide shows, again, a very straightforward and basic staining protocol. Um, many of you will come across protocols that look similar to this. At the same time, many of you will come across protocols that look somewhat different to this, particularly in relation to the fine detail. But let's just run through um, the basic staining protocol of an indirect stain, as we saw um, in the previous slide. So starting at the top left and following the arrows round, 
Um, obviously, you need to prepare the tissue sections, undertake any antigen retrieval that's necessary, um, inhibit any endogenous enzyme activity. You will usually then undertake a blocking step with a 1 to 2 percent solution of species serum and that species being the same species as the secondary antibody that you're going to use is raised in. So if you're going to use a rabbit anti-mouse antibody you block at this stage with a 1 to 2 percent solution of rabbit serum. This is effectively just to block any non-specific binding of those antibodies to the tissues. You then add the primary antibody and incubate it on your tissues. Um, I put 30 to 60 minutes um, here. Your incubation times can vary significantly um, depending on the antibody that you use and perhaps your own preferred methods. Um, some people will actually incubate overnight. Um, some people for as little as 30 minutes as shown here. Your temperature of incubation can also vary. Um, much staining is undertaken at room temperature, um, but people also stain at 4 degrees and even at 37 degrees. Having added the primary antibody, it's important to wash that off. And then you add the secondary antibody um, and again incubate that for 30 to 60 minutes. You undertake a further wash and then you add the substrate for the enzyme, either um, DAB, um, is a common substrate for horseradish peroxidase or fast red as a substrate for alkaline phosphatase. With a further wash, um, you then add a counter stain, um, almost always hematoxylin to the tissues. So you can actually now see the individual cell structure. This is the common blue counter stain. And with the stained cells, you'll see brown color for horseradish peroxidase or a red with alkaline phosphatase. Um, you can mount um, cover slips on your slides and study them under the microscope. Again, this is a, a very basic staining protocol outlining the, the standard steps. Um, many of you will have slight changes to this, but it gives you a, a good outline. So moving on a little bit to thinking about the antibodies, etc., that you're going to use. And the first thing I wanted to mention was choosing primary antibodies. In terms of choosing your primary antibodies, one of the main things to consider is their specificity and their characterization. Are they specific um, for the antigen that you're interested in? That really should go without saying. Um, but are they only specific for that antigen or is there any known cross-reactivity? How well is that antibody being characterized? Um, very importantly, obviously, for IHC is to know whether or not they've been validated in immunohistochemistry techniques. On the assumption that you're buying your antibody from a commercial supplier, hopefully um, much of this information will be available from that supplier on the product data sheet. They may, for instance, tell you that the antibody will not work in formalin fixed tissue, or they may tell you that to make it work in formal and fixed tissue, you need to undertake um, antigen retrieval, either with a particular enzyme or at a certain pH. So check the uh, supplier data sheet for all the information they have uh, about that antibody and its uh, activity in IHC. Hopefully there will also be information about the working dilution of the antibody that is recommended. In addition to supplier data, it's always useful to check um, for published references on that particular antibody clone. And remember, there may also be some online resources available um, with data either from that particular antibody or certainly for that particular antigen, perhaps showing you staining patterns that you might expect in different tissues. Perhaps one of the best well known um, is the protein atlas, um, link of which I've given at the bottom of this slide. Moving on from primary antibodies, um, if you're using a secondary antibody, um, how do you choose that? Um, it may seem very, very obvious that your secondary antibody has to be specific for the primary antibody. Um, but do consider and make sure um, that it is the right antibody. If, for instance, you're used to using a lot of mouse monoclonal antibodies um, and you're using 
uh, a rabbit anti-mouse secondary in many cases. Be sure to remember this if you suddenly have an experiment where you are now using a rabbit monoclonal antibody and your secondary antibody therefore needs to be different. Um, again, perhaps goes without saying that not all secondary antibodies are the same. Um, consider the epitope of the primary antibody that is recognized. Is it the FC portion, um, heavy and light chains, or perhaps unusually um, a light chain itself? How has the antibody been purified? Um, affinity purified secondary antibodies um, will have higher TETA um, than those that have simply been purified um, by protein A or perhaps even just uh, ammonium sulfate precipitation. And also consider if the antibody has been absorbed against any cross-reacting immunoglobulins. So that's um, also something to consider in terms of how good your secondary antibody is going to be and the level of background staining you might expect. Obviously also consider what enzyme conjugate you're working with. Does your secondary antibody need to be conjugated to HRP or alkaline phosphatase? Or you may be using a, a three-layer system, an, an avidin biotin system, in which your secondary antibody may be conjugated to biotin, which you cannot use to visualize enzymes directly. Um, you come in then with a third layer of streptavidin HRP or streptavidin um, alkaline phosphatase. You may also want to consider staining kits that are supplied um, by a number of suppliers, and these often contain a number of other components, buffer components, perhaps blocking components, etc. Okay, so moving on um, from thinking about your antibodies, one of the ways to think about some of the um, processes of IHC is just to briefly think about a little bit of troubleshooting. Um, what may go wrong and how you can help to put that right. And this underlines some of the general techniques anyway. So perhaps um, the most obvious thing that can go wrong is that you don't get any staining at all or you only get weak staining. And I've listed here just some of the things to consider and this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list. Um, firstly, um, consider your primary antibody. Um, check uh, the teeter or the dilution, are you using that at the, at the best dilution? If you haven't used this antibody before, it's probably worthwhile um, undertaking a titration, testing it at different dilutions to find the best one. You may uh, be used to using a particular antibody, perhaps at a 1 in 100 or 1 in 500 dilution. Um, that's not going to be the same for every primary antibody. Some may need to be diluted a lot less or even a lot more. Make sure that you're using the correct retrieval techniques if they're needed. So again, follow a manufacturer's instruction if they're there. If not, you may have to test some of these out yourself. You may also want to consider uh, secondary antibody performance. Um, same sort of questions. Is it the right specificity? Have you optimized the TETA of the secondary antibody? And as I mentioned previously, is it the right um, secondary antibody? Another thing to consider if you're looking at uh, a tissue that you're not used to working with is um, what is the antigen expression? Um, is the antigen that you're looking for definitely present in that tissue? Um, if you're not certain and you get a negative result, maybe that's exactly the result you're expecting. Does your tissue actually have the antigen present. Um, using appropriate positive controls to check that everything else is working is probably the best answer to this. Um, another thing you need to do is to confirm activity of your substrate. You can do this very, very easily. Um, once you've prepared the substrate for the enzyme, um, just keep a, a small amount of it and add a tiny amount of the uh, enzyme conjugated antibody to it and make sure that a color change takes place. That just makes sure that you've got everything um, in place in the solution, the right pH and the activators, etc. I mentioned that incubation times and temperatures vary in different examples and, and different laboratories. You may, with a particular antibody, need to optimize incubation times and or temperatures. Um, 
and it may not be the standard method that you use that will work best with a new antibody. I've already on this slide talked about positive controls. Um, if you have a positive controlled tissue that you know reacts with the antibody you're using, um, then it may be good to use that. And also, if you have no staining or perhaps weak staining, um, consider if um, the processing of the tissue may be a problem. Over fixed tissue, particularly formalin fixed tissue, um, if it's been fixed for too long, uh, the damage to the antigens may be too great and they may result in a lack of staining. The other common area that people struggle with in IHC is high background staining. And a few things to think about with these, and you'll note that some of them overlap with the points to consider with negative or weak staining. Firstly though, consider um, if you might just be seeing endogenous enzyme activity, or perhaps if you're using an avidin biotin system, um, endogenous biotin in tissues. Um, if you may be seeing this, is that blocked effectively? Then you come to looking at the performance of the primary and the secondary antibody. Um, if you're getting high background staining for both of these, you really want to be looking very closely at the titration and the dilution of these antibodies. And particularly with the secondary antibody, is your very first blocking step um, effective? Do you need to increase the um, percentage of serum being used to block? Um, or if you're not undertaking a blocking step at all, do you need to consider introducing one? Again, check your incubation times and temperatures for both of the antibodies. It may be the case that you're now incubating too long. You can reduce an incubation time, um, and that may help you reduce background staining. Um, increasing the washing steps um, is also a fairly obvious thing to look at when you're looking at high background staining. And again, similarly to weak staining, poor fixation itself um, can be a problem with background staining. Um, particularly poor processing um, of frozen tissues um, can lead to some quite high levels of background staining um, appearing and making it very difficult to interpret your results. In terms of um, troubleshooting, there are obviously various other things that can be considered, but those are the two main approaches um, to look at. I've put up a couple of slides now in relation to some particularly special challenges in relation to IHC. The first one I've put up is looking at uh, the potential for undertaking um, dual staining or two color staining on a tissue. Looking at two antigens simultaneously um, can indeed be a very powerful technique to study antigen expression. Um, but it's particularly challenging in IHC as compared to, for instance, uh, flow cytometry. Um, because indirect staining is so commonly used. In the diagram on the left, you'll see a system um, that works for two-color staining. Um, using the same principle as I showed before, um, you have antigens um, seen here. Some are uh, kind of rhomboid in, in shape, some are triangular. And you'll see the black antibodies bind to their antigen on the left, and the red primary antibodies bind to their antigen. Um, I've used black and red to indicate species of the antibody. So let's assume that the black antibodies are mouse antibodies and the red antibodies are rabbit antibodies. You can then use um, secondary antibodies that are specific for those. Um, they can be from the same species. You might have a goat anti-mouse and a goat anti-rabbit. The anti-mouse may be uh, conjugated to horseradish peroxidase, uh, the anti-rabbit to alkaline phosphatase, and you can see the difference in enzyme labels on this left-hand diagram. In those conditions, you can undertake two-color staining without too much problem. You have to make sure that your secondary antibodies don't cross-react with the other primary antibodies, etc. But in principle, this is relatively straightforward. Um, if you do have the same species of primary antibody, but they're from a different subclass, 
Um, you may also be able to undertake this if you have some very highly specific subclass um, related antibodies. However, in many cases, you won't have antibodies available from two different species. You might have just a rabbit monoclonal or polyclonal, or maybe just mouse monoclonals. And on the right hand side, um, you can see you won't be able to differentiate between mouse monoclonals binding to different antigens. Your uh, secondary antibody to the uh, mouse antibodies will bind to them and you won't be able to distinguish those at all. So jaw staining can be particularly um, challenging in particular tissues. In another example of a difficult challenge, again relating to antibody reactivity, um, uh, is the so-called mouse-on-mouse staining system. Obviously a huge amount of basic research has been carried out in mouse models and I think it's also fair to say that the majority of antibodies used in research these days are raised in mouse, they're mouse monoclonals. A mouse antibody staining uh, an antigen in mouse tissues presents a particular challenge um, and that challenge this time comes from the fact that the mouse tissue will have various levels of endogenous mouse immunoglobulin um, within it. And again, diagrammatically, you can see this here. You can see the antigens to which your mouse monoclonal is binding, and the two triangles. Um, but you'll also see, diagrammatically, two other black antibodies that I've um, basically shown the other way around, shown with their FC portion um, attached to the tissue. Now, this might be soluble antigen just um, attached to the tissue because it's been washing through the tissue um, as part of the blood system, or these may be attached to the surface of B lymphocytes. Either way, it's mouse antibody, and when you add your uh, secondary antibody specific for the mouse immunoglobulin, here shown in red, it will bind just as well to the endogenous mouse immunoglobulin as it does to the mouse monoclonal that you're using for staining and you won't be able to distinguish the difference. This is a particularly challenging system in immunohistology. With the use of knockout systems, etc., in mice, it's also becoming increasingly important. This brings me to considering um, the approach of direct staining in IHC. Now, this is a relatively unusual approach um, but is gaining uh, a lot of popularity more recently. This is where you actually apply direct staining, where the primary antibody itself is linked either to HRP or alkaline phosphatase, and it has a number of advantages. One of the main advantages um, is the fact that you will save a considerable amount of time um, in your processing and, and your immunostaining because you're removing significant steps. You don't require any secondary antibodies and you need fewer wash steps. The fact you don't need secondary antibodies also saves you in uh, material costs. The direct staining approach also allows you to undertake simple two-colored staining and also simple mouse-on-mouse -mouse staining. You don't have to worry about cross-reactivity of secondary antibodies uh, with other antibodies or with tissue components. However, availability of directly conjugated antibodies for IHC staining is very highly restricted. Um, it's very difficult to find antibodies um, for immunohistology use directly conjugated to HRP or alkaline phosphatase in commercial antibody catalogues. If you just look at the protocol that I showed earlier, I've just re-shown this with the steps um, important steps taken out if you go to a direct staining protocol. So you don't need to block with the species serum, you can avoid the secondary antibody step, and you can avoid some of the wash steps. So that's going to cut your processing time down um, by at least an hour, maybe um, closer to two hours, and save you the reagents as I mentioned. I've got a couple of slides here with some example staining to show that direct staining in IHC um, 
as well as being very straightforward, provides you with very good results. In this particular case, on the left-hand side, um, is staining um, of a B-cell-specific marker, CD20, with a well-known CD20-specific antibody, um, a clone called L26. And on the left-hand side, uh, a standard indirect uh, approach has been taken, and uh, a secondary antibody staining kit um, using the DACO Envision system has been used. And you can see um, CD20 positive B cells stained brown within the tissues. On the right hand side is the same tissue. Uh, this has been also stained with L26, but this time the L26 has actually been directly conjugated to horseradish peroxidase using uh, a lightning link conjugation technique, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And again, you can see very clearly uh, the CD20 positive B cells within these tissues. You'll see that the staining intensity is very, very similar, um, and you've saved um, considerably on time and reagents um, in undertaking this staining. So that's a comparison of direct and indirect in a single color. And on the next slide, um, this is uh, simple direct two-color staining. Um, and on this slide, we're looking at uh, a human tonsil. Um, we've used the same antibody, the CD20, clone L26, conjugated to HRP, and you can see uh, brown stained B cells, um, especially towards the, the sort of top and left of, of the section. Um, but we've combined that now with a second antibody, this time specific for the T cell marker, CD3. And that has been conjugated to alkaline phosphatase, again using a lightning link kit. The two have been incubated um, simultaneously on the tissue, um, and then both have been visualized with their appropriate uh, substrates. And you can see um, that basically B cells and T cells are present in this tissue in different areas, which is exactly what you would expect. And so here's an example of the direct staining making two color immunohistology very, very simple indeed. So I'd just like to finish with a few slides, um, really considering how you can prepare direct antibody conjugates yourself. I mentioned that the great majority of commercially available antibodies for IHC aren't available directly conjugated. Um, if you ask a, an antibody company to make one of those for you on a custom basis, or if you have your own reagent, um, that can be expensive and time consuming. Um, however, you can use uh, a series of conjugation kits, the lightning link conjugation kits from Innova Bioscience, uh, which offer a very quick and an easy to use solution um, for your conjugation needs. You can conjugate as little as 10 micrograms of antibody or scale that up very easily. So just briefly, um, what is the lightning link technology? It's actually the world's fastest and easiest to use um, and most efficient conjugation technology. It literally takes 30 seconds of your hands on time. Um, we actually have more than 50 labels available. Um, many of these are fluorescent proteins and dyes and today we're really focusing on the enzymes, horseradish peroxidase and alkaline phosphatase. Um, but you can also use fluorescent um, techniques in IHC. I just haven't focused on them today. For your labeling reaction, uh, all you need to do is to take your antibody, very quickly add a, add a modifier solution, and then immediately add that solution to your freeze-dried enzyme that is presented in a vial. Um, pipette that up and down. That's just about your 20 seconds of hands-on time. Incubate um, the antibody for three hours, and then you stop the reaction and you're ready to use that antibody. That direct conjugate is now ready to titrate and use um, in your immunohistology experiment. Some of the key aspects of lightning link technology are listed on this slide. And one of the key ones is that you actually get 100% antibody recovery. Uh, there is no separation step um, involved post-conjugation. In many traditional techniques, this separation step 
results in a significant loss of antibody um, and your yield is generally perhaps in the range of 50 to 70 percent. With lightning link your yield is 100 percent. As you've seen from the um, previous slides of staining, um, the lack of separation step doesn't cause you any problems in terms of background staining, etc. Lightning link is scalable. You can do test conjugations at 10 microgram scale, uh, and we sell um, kits to conjugate up to 5 milligrams of antibody, and we can make that um, larger for uh, larger scale use um, on a customized basis. The simplicity of the technique um, virtually eliminates any batch-to-batch -batch variability that you would see with traditional conjugation technology. And you can actually use um, the technology um, to label not just antibodies, but other proteins or other biomolecules. So if in your IHC experiment you're looking at a protein that isn't an antibody, um, but something that may bind to another ligand on the tissue, you can label that directly as well. The chemistry provides covalent conjugation, um, so the conjugate is stable for a long period. And as I mentioned before, these kits are available for conjugating antibodies both to horseradish peroxidase and alkaline phosphatase, um, as well as to biotin and to a wide range of fluorescent dyes um, that you might also want to use in some of your techniques. There's just a couple of things to consider. Um, about your conjugation and really it's just about the antibody that you have yourself. So you need to make sure the antibody is in the right format. One of the things is that it's uh, at a concentration of a milligram per mil. Um, if it's lower than that it's quite straightforward with some accessory reagents to concentrate um, that up. Also make sure um, that your antibody is pure. Firstly um, make sure it's been purified in the first place, that it's not in a format such as ascites or tissue culture supernatant. And also make sure that uh, BSA, for instance, as a stabilizer, hasn't been added back in post-purification, um, uh, as uh, that um, w will not be good for your conjugation reaction or indeed your staining results. In terms of buffer formulation, uh, most common formulations that antibodies are presented in are entirely suitable. Um, PBS, for example, being the most common is absolutely fine for conjugation. Do make sure that any amines such as glycine, etc., are truly absent. Lightning link kits are optimized for antibody labeling, but as I mentioned, if you want to use them for other proteins, it's simple to do so. You just need to know the size of your protein and make an adjustment. Um, for the uh, molar ratios of conjugation. And uh, uh, the technical support team at INOVA can definitely help you with those calculations and how to approach that. So I hope that's been a, a useful summary of immunohistology. And uh, I'm going to pass back to Claudina now um, just to uh, approach um, and introduce the question and answer session. Um, We'll look at some questions in just a moment. Um, I can see you're already typing some of them in. We'll answer as many as we can and get back to the rest of you by email um, as soon as possible. And uh, thanks for listening today. Okay, thank you for that, Andy. Um, as Andy just mentioned, it is time for a Q&A session. So there's still time to send in some more questions. Again, um, all you have to do is type into the questions box, which you can see circled in red here. Um, and we'll be sure to either answer them now or by email a bit later on if we run out of time. Um, however, in the meantime, just to give Andy a couple of minutes um, to think about the questions, I was going to tell you uh, where you can find us in person in the coming months if you would like to chat with one of our representatives. So first off, we'll be attending the Bio International Convention in San Diego from June 23rd to the 26th. And if you would like to set up a meeting with Tom Speedy, our corporate business manager, then please get in touch. And after that, we'll be exhibiting at the American Association for Clinical Chemistry annual meeting, which is in Chicago from July 27th to the 31st. And please feel free to stop by our booth or alternatively contact us if you would like to set up a meeting there. So, okay, I hope Andy's ready. Um, it's time to answer some IHC questions. Okay, so, see, our first question today is, 
would alkaline phosphatase or HRP be better to use in my experiment? Okay, thanks Claudina. Um, I guess it's fair to say that most IHC um, is done with horse radish peroxidase, um, generally in combination with the DAB substrate that I mentioned earlier. And that gives you a, a brown pigmentation um, after, after the substrate development. Um, we can, of course, uh, use alkaline phosphatase, as I mentioned, and you use a substrate called fast red with this, which obviously gives you a red um, precipitate and visualization. Um, in terms of which one to use, um, really just think about the tissues that you're um, working with. I mentioned um, endogenous enzyme activity um, earlier on, and some tissues um, suffer from one particular type of uh, enzyme uh, activity more than others. So thinking of some examples, um, blood-based tissues um, often have high levels of endogenous peroxidase. I'm thinking perhaps about bone marrow, etc. Uh, you might prefer to use alkaline phosphatase in that example. Um, some tissues, however, have higher levels of alkaline phosphatase, and indeed some of these might be resistant to the blocking that I mentioned with levamisole. Le um, thinking here really of gut, particularly, and perhaps bone. Uh, if you've got those tissues, I would use horseradish peroxidase. Um, I guess thinking about tissues and uh, endogenous enzyme activity, I mentioned um, a little bit in the in the uh, webinar earlier about biotin staining systems. Remember, some tissues also have high levels of biotin and may not be suitable um, for those staining systems, particularly kidney or liver. So, um, in effect, um, you can use either HRP or alkaline phosphatase. Um, consider the tissues that you have, and that might help you make a make a decision. Otherwise, the choice is entirely yours. Great, thanks Andy. So our next question is, for how long should I incubate a primary antibody? Okay, that's um, a, an interesting question. I think you'll have uh, noted that I was not too committal during the, the talk earlier about incubation times. The slide mentions 30 to 60 minutes, but I did say um, I believe that people can change this. Um, Probably going back to basics, the, the one thing to remember is that your antibodies will all have um, slightly different affinities. Uh, put simply, a high affinity antibody will bind to its antigen more quickly and will wash off less easily, and a low affinity antibody will bind more slowly and relatively easily be washed off. Um, you may find with a high affinity antibody, a shorter incubation period is possible. Um, but also with a lower affinity antibody, the opposite, an, an increased incubation time may actually help with your staining intensity. Um, whereas I mentioned 30 to 60 minute incubations, um, there are many labs that would use overnight incubations at four degrees um, for their antibodies. Um, sometimes that allows them to dilute their antibodies a little further as well. I think that's all a long-winded way of saying um, that it really depends on your antibody and it's best to optimize um, your staining conditions for the individual antibody you're using. Um, if you're using more than one antibody, it goes without saying that if you want to use just one technique, there will be some level of compromise involved. Um, and, and so you're going to have to just judge that by the antibodies you're using. It's also fair to say that with secondary antibodies, uh, they're generally of um, good high affinity and a 30 to 60 minute incubation time would be fairly standard with those. Great. So for our next question, um, let's see, there's a question here. Surely direct IHC will give me less sensitivity in my assay. Okay. Um, Again, uh, interesting question and perhaps a, a common assumption, um, not just with IHC but with many immunoassays, that using a secondary antibody um, enhances sensitivity, mainly by um, just building up layers of antibody 
uh, and therefore of substrate. You'll have seen from the staining slides of CD20 that I showed um, that actually the results in these cases show staining of very similar intensity and you in practice see very very little difference. Um, interestingly enough when staining is in a two-stage technique um, you're washing off of the primary antibody or the, the wash step to remove the excess probably also removes some of the antibody that was bound to the antigen in the first place and so effectively is reducing um, staining intensity at that stage. Um, also remember that any secondary antibody system um, has a potential disadvantage of increasing background staining and you avoid that with direct um, staining. Uh, therefore your backgrounds may be lower along with similar levels of sensitivity um, and you get um, very, very good results with direct staining, um, generally just as good as you get with indirect staining. Okay, and for our next question uh, is, I seem to get variable results in staining my tissues, although I am using the same reagents and technique every time. How can that be? Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'm sure I remember those sorts of results um, in doing some immunohistology staining. Um, and you think you've done everything exactly the same, and you probably have done everything exactly the same, um, and you really can't understand what the difference is. Um, probably a couple of areas that, that I would think about. One is um, just make obviously absolutely sure that you've, the dilutions, etc., you're using are indeed exactly the same. But also consider more subtle things. For instance, if you're doing staining at room temperature in the laboratory, um, is that room temperature really the same every time? Um, perhaps the temperature at different times of day, uh, maybe if the sun's coming through the window, um, or various other things like that might change the temperature a little bit, and that can have an effect. I would think perhaps more importantly, you might want to think about fixation of your tissues. Um, so if you're using different tissue blocks and you're getting different results, it may well be that they've undergone slightly different fixation times. Um, and if a particular block has been overfixed, um, the staining intensity will vary. You can actually see staining intensity vary within a single block um, if the fixation hasn't actually been complete um, during, uh, during that process. So I think about some of those things as well as the obvious things about the, the antibodies and the reagents themselves. Okay, thanks Andy. And for our next question, you mentioned that there should be no BSA present when I'm conjugating antibodies. I'm sure I've seen that other kits say this is okay. Uh, great, that's actually a really important question. Um, it's quite true, you can actually conjugate an antibody in the presence of VSA, um, both with a lightning link kit and indeed with, with other approaches. Um, but remember that BSA is a protein and you will also label the BSA itself. Um, what this does most obviously is to reduce the effectiveness of the conjugation to the antibody. In many assays, perhaps especially in assays such as ELISA, uh, that's not necessarily a problem if you're not really at the edge of the sensitivity in the assay you're running. However, um, in immunohistology particularly, um, there is data showing that uh, conjugated BSA, and indeed um, gelatin for that matter, um, may actually bind to tissue components. Um, and if that is the case, um, you will see this as apparent background staining. Um, the BSA may bind in an indirect assay if it's there as a stabilizer in your antibody, but obviously won't be visualized. But if you've labeled it to HRP or alkaline phosphatase, you'll see apparent uh, background staining. So our advice to avoid BSA isn't that it stops the conjugation reaction um, completely, but it's to make sure that you get optimal results in all of your assays. Uh, and it's important that you understand the processes uh, that are going on there. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that, Andy. Um, I'm afraid we're just about running out of time today. So I see that there's still quite a few outstanding questions. But like I said,
Um, we will definitely respond to those individually by email as soon as as soon as possible. Um, so just please bear in mind that this webinar is being recorded, so we will upload it to our YouTube channel in the next few days so that you can always come back to it. Um, you can find our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Innova Biosciences. And please do keep an eye out on our social media channels where we'll be advertising our upcoming webinars. And if you would like to receive a PDF copy of the presentation or a link to the video recording of the webinar, then please contact me. You can find my contact details on any of the webinar emails that you've received. So thank you very much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the webinar and that you will be able to join us for the next session in June.